Okay, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Kwong, and I'm the interim director of the Center for Vaccine Preventable Diseases at the Dell Elena School of Public Health. I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar on routine immunization catch up during COVID 19 in Canada. Our panelists will discuss the ways in which the COVID 19 pandemic has impacted the delivery of routine immunizations by physicians, public health units, and pharmacists. They will also cover how we can improve access to routine immunizations during and looking beyond the pandemic. First, I would like to um, start with the Indigenous land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Huron, and Haudenosaunee Indigenous peoples on which the Dalalana School of Public Health now stands. The territory was a subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We would also like to pay our respects to all of our ancestors and to our present elders. So a few housekeeping issues. We would like to address as many questions as possible. You can direct any questions you'd like answered by the panelists to the Q&A function and you can direct any questions you have after this webinar to the email address uh, for the center, which is cvpd.dlsph at utoronto.ca. So I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. Um, first off, we have Dr. Sean Morris, um, who is a clinician scientist in the Division of Infectious Diseases and a scientist in Child Health Evaluative Sciences and the Center for Global Health, uh, for Global Child Health at the Peter Gilligan Center for Research and Learning at the Hospital for Sick Children. He is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and is cross-appointed to the Division of Clinical Public Health at the Dell and the School of Public Health um, at the University of Toronto. Sean's major global uh, and domestic research focuses uh, include um, in reducing childhood mortality and morbidity from infectious diseases and neonatal sepsis. He is the co-PI of the Canadian Pediatric Surveillance Program COVID-19 study. He is also the Sick Kids Lead Investigator for multiple national and international research and surveillance networks, including IMPACT, GeoSentinel, and the Special Immunization Clinic Network. In addition to Canada, he currently conducts trials and research in South Asia and East Africa. Second, we have Karen Beckerman. Karen is the Associate Director of Research of Vaccine Preventable Diseases at Toronto Public Health. She has extensive public health experience in organizational planning and performance. Her previous work experience includes research, primary care practice, and nursing in Toronto, Montreal, Germany, and Morocco. And third, we have Ajit, Ajit Johal. Ajit is a community pharmacist in Vancouver, British Columbia, where he leads a clinical services program focused on immunizations. He is a clinical instructor in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of British Columbia. Ajit founded and is a clinical director of Immunize.io, through which he has worked with numerous organizations and communities to improve education and reduce barriers to vaccination. So we'll start with our three panelists and then we'll open up uh, to questions from the audience. So Sean, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen. Can you let me know, Jeff, if you can see this? That's perfect. Thanks, Sean. Great. Um, okay. so. Jeff, thank you very much for the introduction. So again, I'm Sean Morris. I'm an infectious disease doctor and a scientist at, at SickKids Hospital. And I have no uh, disclosures pertinent to today's talk to make. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit of background and, and this audience obviously does not need to be told this, but routine childhood vaccines are important. They're a critically important part of, of uh, a healthy childhood, whether in Canada or anywhere around the world. This is a slide that I like a lot that shows the um, all the states that make up the United States and the number of cases of measles that each of them had in the years prior to and after the introduction of measles vaccine in the early 1960s. And what you can see is that essentially every state had thousands of cases of measles on an annual basis. And then these were 
um, essentially eliminated um, within just a few years post um, vaccine introduction. So I think that this is a slide that really does um, uh, symbolize the, the effectiveness of, of routine childhood immunizations. So a question, um, I guess an implicit question to, to today's seminar is can outbreaks of infectious diseases disrupt routine childhood immunization? And so what I wanna show is some data from another recent uh, um, infectious disease outbreak. This one fortunately did not become a global pandemic. However, it was certainly a regional epidemic in West Africa and that's the Ebola outbreak that was just a couple of years ago. Um, and what this paper shows is that uh, during the Ebola outbreak in, um, in this case, in Sierra Leone, there was a reduction in, in this case, measles vaccine, uh, as well as the pentavalent vaccine of somewhere between about 15 to 50%, depending on the actual subgeographic region. Um, then a question, the question becomes, can an infectious disease outbreak, which affects routine immunization result in an increase in vaccine preventable diseases? And this is another figure from uh, Guinea, so a regional neighbor of Sierra Leone, that shows exactly this happening. So the, the black bars here are confirmed in probable cases of Ebola. Similar to Sierra Leone, there was a reduction in measles immunization. And then what was seen is a dramatic increase in, in cases of measles. Uh, a measles vaccination campaign was launched and then fairly quickly, um, as, as there was catch up in terms of the routine immunizations, the new cases, the incident cases of measles decreased. So this is an example of, a, of another infectious disease disrupting routine immunization in a different part of the world. So as the, the COVID pandemic um, spread and, and began affecting different countries, uh, the topic of what we're, we're dealing with today, which is disruption to routine immunizations in our own setting became newsworthy. And this is a New York Times article from, uh, I believe it was, it was in April, outlining exactly this issue. The figures on the right are from an MMWR report. The top figure shows the um, vaccines, both the measles containing vaccine and other vaccines other than influenza that were being ordered by physicians and healthcare centers and public health systems. And what we see is a dramatic decrease beginning in about the middle of March. The figure on the bottom shows vaccines actually being administered. And in parallel to the decrease in vaccines being ordered, we saw a decrease in vaccines being administered. Interesting, there's a bit of a bifurcation in the ages here. And what we see is that as the pandemic progressed, um, there was a, a continued big impact in the older kids in terms of their vaccines, whereas perhaps the system shifted towards prioritizing vaccines in younger children. And this is something that I'll talk about in, in our Ontario data in just a minute. So in terms of COVID-19 itself in Canada, where are we now? As I think we all know, we, we unfortunately are, are nowhere good. So we are well into our second wave of, uh, of infection across the country. And a major difference between the, the first wave in the spring and, and the second wave, which began in the fall and is uh, ongoing now, is the parts of the country that were affected. So the first wave was, the vast majority was in Ontario and Quebec, whereas now essentially all parts of Canada with um, the notable partial exception of Atlantic Canada is, is deeply affected by, by ongoing incident infections. So in terms of routine immunization in Ontario, um, this is uh, the, the Ontario routine publicly funded schedule. And all I wanna highlight here is that it requires six in-person visits in the first 18 months of life in order to have a child fully immunized with the primary series. And in-person is, is critically important when we, when we see what some of the impacts have been on um, the healthcare system. So what I wanna do now is just show a little bit of data of a study that we've recently com completed. Um, this was really led by Pierre-Philippe Pichet-Renaud, who is an infectious disease fellow at SickKids, as well as a group of family physicians and pediatricians across the province uh, whose names are listed here. What we've done with this study is we sent out a cross-sectional survey to over 1,300 pediatricians and just under 2,000 family physicians in Ontario at the end of the first wave, so between the end of May and the beginning of July of this year. The survey had three main sections. Uh, we tried to collect socio-demographic and practice characteristics 
um, of the respondents. We asked about the impact of COVID-19 on clinical practice in general, and then we also asked about the specific impact on routine childhood immunization. We had um, in total just under 500 respondents of whom 60% were pediatricians and 40% were family physicians. You can see here that the majority were in and around the, the GTA and the Golden Horseshoe area with a smaller number in other parts of Ontario. Um, about 75% or 74% of the pediatricians routinely gave vaccines and almost all of the family physicians who responded routinely gave vaccines. So a few, a few key findings. Number one, so this is the proportion of in-person visits. These are violin plots on the left. So the sort of the teal or the green is the median proportion of visits in person prior to the pandemic. And you can see that a median of 100% of pediatric visits and 96% of family physician visits were in person prior to the pandemic. And in both cases, um, for both specialties, this dramatically decreased as the pandemic progressed. So right off the bat, you can see that it's going to be harder to have uh, kids immunized with the decrease in in-person visits. In terms of impact of COVID-19 on immunization services, the, the red we classified as essentially complete disruption of immunization practices. The blue was partial disruption. And you can see that um, some practices completely closed, some practices completely postponed vaccines, and other practices simply told their um, their uh, practice members that they needed to get immunized elsewhere. Um, other practices continued to provide immunization, but they restricted it, rest restricted it to specific ages, generally the younger kids, or only specific vaccines, or only to children who were considered at high risk. Other impacts, 30% um, reported that they were providing immunizations to patients from other clinics or other practices that were no longer offering the service anymore because of the pandemic. And I think this is really important. A majority of the respondents indicated that they did not have a good system in place to keep track of who, have may, who may have missed doses during the pandemic. Uh, barriers to immunization services were identified. The biggest barrier was parents being concerned about contracting COVID-19 by interacting with the healthcare system. Um, other barriers were, were more practice related and included um, staff being concerned about contracting um, COVID-19, lack of PPE, um, and you can see some other issues here. I think the last slide here are some potential solutions that, that came up in our survey. Uh, and these included um, providing access to PPE, reorganizing patient flow. So for example, um, not having a, a busy waiting room full of kids all waiting to be uh, seen by the physicians. Um, or having vaccine specific days or half days as opposed to seeing sick children and healthy children for immunization at the same time, dedicated centers or practices for vaccination, education campaigns, and other things here that we can talk about during the, uh, the discussion part. So that is uh, all I wanted to present now and I think I'm passing over to my colleague now. Great, thanks Sean. On to Karen. Okay, so uh, thank you, Sean. That's a great introduction to things in Ontario. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the routine immunization uh, from the local public health perspective. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, I have no affiliations, financial or otherwise, to disclose. Um, next slide, thank you. So just a little bit, especially for those of you who aren't from Ontario, uh, some of the key roles related to childhood immunization that uh, Toronto Public Health is involved in, the school immunization program, which typically takes place in grade seven. Uh, it involves giving three vaccines, uh, human papilloma virus, hepatitis B and meningococcal vaccines. Uh, and because of the schedule for them, it involves two clinics to each school. And when we're at the school, uh, there are students in grade eight, either new to the province or didn't finish it, we do come, we will try to finish those students off before they finish grade eight. Uh, 
we know that when you're trying to um, immunize a large group of students, um, it's actually probably the most effective and efficient way is to do it through schools. Um, the next thing that we do is uh, we implement slash enforce the Immunization of School Pupils Act. So again, for those of you not from Ontario, this is the legislation that requires all students attending school in Ontario uh, up to the age of 18 to be immunized against nine diseases or have a valid exemption, whether medical or philosophical on file. So our role is to collect the immunization information for the students. So you can imagine in Toronto, that's upwards of 400,000 immunization records. Uh, we send reminders to parents to you know, make sure they know. And then uh, if the students aren't fully immunized after the reminders, uh, they can be suspended from school. And we find many, many students are immunized However, we don't have the record. So this is a great way to make sure students in Ontario are immunized and it's really good for um, supporting having high coverage across the province. We also do what we'll call catch up clinics. This is uh, for any student who's missing vaccines to go to school. Um, they can come to one of our clinics to get the vaccine or uh, it's also for the students in the grade seven program, if they missed a dose or didn't complete it when they were in school, as long as they're still eligible for a publicly funded vaccine, we're happy to administer the dose at our clinics. Next slide, please. So um, as you can imagine, and we have not been in schools for a while, on the last school year, we were halfway through the grade seven program. We had done the first visit to all the schools in Toronto, that's 420, 450 um, schools. And we were just getting ready to go back and do the second dose. You have to wait the appropriate time for the spacing of both for hepatitis B and human papillomavirus. So last year's grade seven students did not complete their series and we have not been back in the schools this year. Um, so, you know, this is a concern, as I said, it's uh, trying to get the whole group of grade sevens. It really is the best way to get them all immunized. Um, however, for us, uh, our staff, many of them are busy responding to uh, the COVID pandemic as well as um, let's just say schools have a number of other pressing priorities this year. So trying to negotiate space and have it appropriately physically with physical distancing uh, would be very challenging both for us and the schools and also a large number of the students aren't in school this year. So what this has really done, uh, Oh, sorry, we also interrupted the Immunization of School Pupils Act program last year. Um, and then this year we haven't been able to uh, get started again because of the pandemic. But what this really means is decreased opportunity for students to get immunized through the grade seven program or to really get caught up um, as Sean referred to, people are pretty good about those sort of vaccines under two, but that, you know, four to six year old vaccine, as well as the high school students uh, getting their last vaccine before they finish, that often gets missed. And the Immunization of School Pupils Act is great for making sure they leave school fully immunized. Um, I think some of the real opportunities we've seen this year uh, is more partnership, certainly amongst um, healthcare providers in the community looking for ways to bring people together to immunize. Um, in the fall, people are very focused on the flu vaccine. So we've seen great uh, collaborative work with some of our uh, Ontario health teams, um, 
people running group clinics, we've been able to access space that we hadn't previously been able to. And we see more interest uh, in the public in getting immunized um, at their local pharmacy, getting their flu shot. So that's, that's exciting to see uh, that there could be opportunity through there. Um, next slide, please. So what are we doing? So right now we're busy doing our uh, flu clinics. And so this is just one of the posters we have. It's really geared towards the flu clinic, uh, flu immunization, but you can see many things that would resonate if you're going to any healthcare setting. Uh, right now, um, we have not done any clinics to catch up the students from last year. Some health units were able to do clinics in grade seven. Uh, this year, uh, four of the 23 health units that I heard from were able to get into the schools uh, this fall. Uh, one of them, albeit it was partial, they did tend to be the smaller health units in the more outlying areas of the province. Um, some health units are providing immunization in their local offices, either through the summer to finish last year's student or into the fall. The way the system works in Toronto, we don't have a regularly scheduled clinic and the spaces that we use for our catch-up clinics aren't accessible to us right now. So that's been a challenge. Again, as I said before, and many of our staff are busy responding to the um, pandemic. Uh, we have not begun to implement the Immunization of School Pupils Act. Um, however, there's nothing to stop us if things settle down from at least sending all parents a reminder and just letting them know uh, that they need to report their uh, immunization status to the public health unit and we can also let them know what vaccines their child is missing. As you know, and this is a big uh, issue in Toronto, we do have a lot of newcomers who've come from other countries, um, often immunized on a different schedule than here. Uh, we are hoping to offer some clinics to get the grade seven started in the spring, in the winter and the spring. Uh, we won't be doing them in the schools but we're looking at just sending notifications through the school system. There's great distribution to our partners at the uh, school board, various school boards in Toronto. Um, you know, we look forward to being able to start again because we think it's, it's really critical for the students. Um, and, you know, as long as nobody's traveling, maybe we don't worry as much about measles coming into our community. But uh, I think when people start traveling again, we may start to see that resurgence of measles. Um, next slide, please. So some of our challenges uh, and what next. I chose um, this image because I thought it created a, a nice rainbow image in this storm that we're in now. So way to think maybe a little more optimistically. Um, as I, I think I've certainly referred to the limitations um, and sort of our immediate plans are around those clinics. But I think there's also some other um, next steps with the partnerships that we've seen and even the um, speed at which some things have been implemented from a technology perspective. Uh, you know, we'd love to see a registry come so that, you know, we have a good record of who's immunized, but also healthcare providers know it. It would be excellent for them to know who's fully immunized. Um, but our immediate plans are still focused on these grade seven students trying to get back on track with the Immunization of School Pupils Act. And of course, getting ready for the COVID vaccine because that will also be a responsibility uh, with, of Toronto Public Health with other healthcare partners uh, whenever it becomes available for the larger population. Uh, final slide, please. This is one of my favorite quotes. I 
like to say uh, if I came up with it, but I actually heard Natasha Crowcroft say it once, and I just always remember it, and that's that everyone who supports immunization is quietly saving lives every minute of every day, and that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for that. Uh, next, we uh, move on to Ajit. Thanks, Karen, for such a wonderful presentation. And thanks, Sean, for your presentation as well. So I'm going to talk to you from the pharmacist perspective, mainly on how we can enable pharmacists to support immunizations efforts during this time and in the future. So here's my disclosures. Um, no commercial disclosures to support for today's presentation. So just to resonate with what my colleague said, it's very important that we continue to immunize. From a pharmacist perspective, when the pandemic hit in March, we saw an immediate cessation of immunization services. So a lot of pharmacists were seeking information and getting clarification on extended interval between dosages. With my own practice being a specialty immunization practice, we prioritized um, our, our rabies immunization series where, where we couldn't extend the interval. And basically most practices actually stopped uh, providing immunization services until there was more clarification, especially from the World Health Organization and local public health authorities to, to continue to reinforce that immunizations are essential. It is now very clear that immunization is an essential service. So hopefully in the midst of pandemics, we continue to see the importance and find ways to continue our immunizations to prevent other vaccine preventable diseases. So I guess in, in whenever we find ourselves in a bit of a, a crisis, um, Winston Churchill always says, never let a good crisis go to waste. So are we asking the right questions? And the questions we have here, we have this cohort of, of individuals uh, who are need to be caught up in their immunizations. We need to find ways to innovatively deliver immunizations in the future, uh, not just with the COVID-19 vaccine, but also in this sort of new normal with more providers working virtually. And I think Dr. Morris had a good point about that in-person visit and, and how do we leverage that to, to really optimize the delivery of our immunization services. So part two for the pharmacy experience comes during influenza season. And nationally, we have seen a massive uptake in pharmacists providing uh, flu shots uh, in the pharmacy. And this has been a steady trend that's increased over the years. And it's important to note though, what we always noticed was even though pharmacists and pharmacies became the top uh, place where most people became vaccinated for their influenza vaccines uh, across the country, is that it was more of a redistribution. It was a convenient way to get influenza immunization done. So it was more of a shift as we saw, we weren't actually seeing as a, as a means to having more people get their flu shot. Fast forward to this season with the massive uptake in influenza immunization, which was many thanks to the great information that was promoted uh, from public health and, and the, uh, the experts and the Minister of Health is that it's important to take uh, respiratory disease out of the equation. So we saw massive, influx of flu shots this season in 2020. Um, and that really showed that with pharmacies actually able, able to accommodate that volume. So they're able to actually, with a spike in uptake rates, they were able to match that, uh, especially in BC and across the country as well. So that's encouraging to see that even with a, a high intake and volume that pharmacists were able to handle that, showing that uh, they can certainly have capacity for community delivery of immunization services. But are flu shots enough? Can we do more? And the, the National Advisory Committee of Immunizations came up with some interim guidance on optimizing the visit. And the key thing there is offering multiple vaccines if required to avoid the number of quote unquote healthcare uh, visits. So if somebody's getting an influenza vaccine, can we update them on other vaccines as well so that we use that as that sort of one-stop shop? And I think that's where community pharmacies have always been sort of had a lot of potential in being that sort of one-stop shop. If it has to have a pharmacist in there to stay open. So there is an immunizer there at all times. Um, can they provide more immunizations beyond influenza? So then we move to the challenges is what current barriers exist for pharmacists to really taking a lead 
uh, in providing robust immunization services. And the first one is probably the biggest is this heterog heterogeneity in scope of practice across the country. So you can see here, that's a, it's a diagram full of red uh, X's and green check marks. And this is all the provinces and territories across Canada. So there's very different varies in what pharmacists can do and can't do. And if we focus on the, the injection of a vaccine, that actually has a whole nother uh, heterogeneity and scope as well. So for most provinces and, and territories, pharmacists can administer an IM injection. Now the problem is, it's not inclusive of all vaccines in this category. So there's different jurisdictional restrictions. Some vaccines require a prescription. Some vaccines can't be administered by the pharmacist. So it's certainly not inclusive of every sort of recommended vaccine that can be administered in the community. The second strategy is access to vaccines. So again, if, if a patient shows up to my pharmacy, I can have the conversation about immunization. However, if I don't have access to the actual vaccines, the vaccination uh, sort of experience is not going to happen. And that's a big challenge is across the country, many, many pharmacies don't have access to publicly funded vaccines. So they can't actually catch people up. Um, in British Columbia, we are fortunate to be one of the few provinces that can actually order publicly funded vaccines from the public health unit, but we do need to order them in advance and we do need to send a pharmacy staff member to pick them up. Ideally, we would want to look to some direct distribution to pharmacies uh, for all recommended vaccines, both private and publicly funded. And the other, th the other challenge, and this is something that I, I personally have been trying to address uh, for some time now is the absence of clinical immunization training in pharmacy curriculums. The training on uh, administration of injections that occurs in pharmacy schools across Canada is very technical. It's all on the technical act of administering an injection. There is a lack of sort of risk assessment based on age and on risk factors for any recommended immunizations uh, that a patient would need. There's also a lack of specialized outpatient practicums on immunizations. So fourth year students doing their final practicums, hands-on experience in the pharmacy setting. If they go into the community, many of them will not see uh, any sort of specialization in uh, immunization practice, which is because of the fact there, there actually has been limited success of incorporation of immunization services into the pharmacy workflow. So I always say there's this dichotomy where there's pharmacies that have immunization services, but there isn't any sort of immunizing pharmacy, a pharmacy that prioritizes immunization and dispenses medication. It's still very set on medication uh, dispensing and counseling with sort of a uh, very uh, rudimentary workflow when it comes to immunization practice, not just the administration, but also the screening and identification as well. So those are some things that need to be improved. Reimbursement. So again, uh, if you look across the country, pharmacists are getting paid different amounts for administering an injection. On the West Coast and on the East Coast, it hovers around $12 to $13 for the administration of a vaccine. But then you look in the, in the middle there with Manitoba and Ontario hovering at $7 and $7.50. And again, I think the biggest uh, issue here is not to say, hey, pay pharmacists more money, is if there is an allocation of resources, what value is coming from that administration of an injection? If it's just limited to just influenza, um, perhaps then when you look at British Columbia, there's other opportunities to provide other vaccines, making that encounter and that visit with the pharmacist more valuable and therefore more deserving of more healthcare resources. So I guess opportunities we can look at. And the other thing is uh, vac records. And uh, Karen, you touched on this as well. Uh, the federal government has put in some investment in terms of having digital tools for patients and reminders. But if we have more healthcare providers and we have this diversity of providers providing immunization services, how are they all going to feed into a central database? Not just of what they've done, but to see what others have done to properly immunize on history. So again, that is again another challenge with the uh, immunization delivery uh, in this country. And then school-based clinics, some challenges we see again, and Karen, you addressed this, with the uh, cessation of school during that initial pandemic when kids started uh, not going to schools. And now with the reintroduction of smaller cohorts, there certainly is a need for overflow and options for 
uh, publicly funded immunizations to catch people up. And a number of those, those options can include the promotion of a pharmacy, and again, having them access to the vaccine and being able to do the service um, as an option for parents. Because again, a lot of parents go with their kids to pharmacies for various other things. Perhaps that could be a place where immunizations can be done. And also the participation of, of pharmacies in mass clinics. And that's something that we've seen a lot here in BC is public health allowing pharmacies to uh, host these mass clinics at places like hospitals or, or senior centers. So perhaps uh, for some schools or some days, because again, holding clinics on several days because student attendance is, is staggered, there's multiple doses in the series, there's catch up. And as you said, Karen, the best way is to do it in school. Why not have a diversity of providers who are able to go in there just to optimize immunization rates? And that is how I want to end my presentation is, can we see pharmacists as improving immunization rates? So we see new vaccines like HPV uh, that were included for both males and females into the public program, still suboptimal rates. Uh, I think we can do better than 70%. So perhaps uh, with those in mind, we can look to optimizing the delivery of, of publicly funded and recommended vaccines uh, in this country. So with that, pass it over to Jeff and we'll start the panel. Great, thanks so much, Ajit. Okay, so just a reminder, if everyone um, who has questions, if you can put them into the Q&A and we'll try to get to uh, as many as we can. But uh, it, while you're doing that, um, you know, there are a few questions that we've prepared. So we'll start with those ones. So, um, you know, so I think the first question for all of you is, you know, when COVID-19 restrictions relax again, what are we going to do to ensure that we're getting back on track? What are we doing now and how are we thinking of moving forward? So anyone can jump in for that question. Um, it's Karen, I'll start things off. Uh, so for us, we're really probably focused on but also really letting parents know uh, what their student, uh, what their children are missing. Um, we know that reminder recalls are a great way to just draw people's attention to the vaccine, uh, what they're missing. And we've done some great partnership work with the um, Behavioral Insights Unit with the Ontario government. I'm really using some behavioral tools in our letters to actually increase response to those uh, reminder letters that we sent. We've been running summer clinics around uh, HPV, uh, human papillomavirus catch up. So we can really leverage those things to try to increase awareness. Um, from our perspective, uh, you know, there are families are welcome to come to our clinics, but what's important is that the needle goes in the arm, whether it's uh, through the primary care physician uh, in Ontario, well, if it's publicly funded, it won't be through the pharmacist, but with that heightened awareness, we can get things back on track. Thanks. Sean or Ajit, do you guys wanna jump, jump in on that way? In yeah, on? I just wanted to add, um, I think something else that we need to, to recognize is that um, even if COVID related restrictions begin to relax, which they will at some point, the, the virus is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. I think even once vaccines roll out. Um, and so I think we need to support whether it's practices like physicians practices, public health or pharmacists, but whoever is immunizing, we need to support these um, people and the systems in which they work to do it safely, to keep themselves safe. And I think we also need to convey the message to families that this is number one, important, and number two, it can be done safely. I mean, I think it was telling that in our data, um, even for practices that remained open and, and wanted to immunize, the two biggest barriers were families being afraid of contacting the healthcare system because they thought they or their kids would become sick number one, and number two, the practitioners and, and the clinic staff worrying that they would become sick. And I mean, anyone who has kids or, or works in healthcare with kids knows that if you, if you visit a, you know, anywhere that provides healthcare to kids between now and, and the spring, almost every single kid will have a, a cough and a runny nose. And, and that's just the, it's the viral respiratory tract infection season. Um, 
So we really need to think about how we can how we can keep people safe and make people understand that it's being done in, in a safe way so that they can make the choices to, to choose to immunize their children. Thanks, Sean. Ajit, do you, have, do you want to make a comment or? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you know when we look at how pharmacists can support this initiative is just optimizing what you have. And you know we talked about how there's a lot of barriers and different pharmacists can have different levels of impact, but everybody has, has an impact. And I think even if you don't have access to the vaccine, even that sort of healthcare provider recommendation and a lot of pharmacists have rapport with their patients and identifying the fact that there is a gap uh, in this in immunizations and constantly keeping that as, as top of mind when they reinforce the message. And for those jurisdictions where pharmacists can in fact get involved is there's certainly an opportunity to become more involved. Yeah, so I'm gonna go switch over to the questions from the Q&A and we'll start off with an easy one for, uh, I mean, hopefully easy one for you Ajit, um, related to what you just said. So to what extent can pharmacists in all provinces and territories provide HPV immunizations for youth and adults in publicly funded programs? I believe that that's an easy question. I think BC might be the only one. Is that correct? Or maybe yeah, not? you're right, Jeff, you, you are correct. Um, so the vaccination can be administered um, Ontario, I can't, I, I don't know too much about that, but I know there's certain restrictions on what needs a prescription, what isn't, and anything that needs a prescription that just introduces another kink to the pathway. So if it doesn't need it, then somebody can show up and, and get vaccinated. Um, and then in Alberta, people can pay privately for it. Um, but again, cost is another barrier that kinks the pathway. So BC is actually uh, as you mentioned, the only province where we could, uh, you know, actually administer a publicly funded HPV catch-up vaccine. Uh, there are certain sort of steps. Uh, we do need to contact our local health unit with a, a sort of a, an assessment saying, hey, this patient showed up, this is their information, which is then reviewed, and then the vaccine is then released for administration. So again, somebody shows up and says, hey, I want, you know, my child to be caught up, we can't immunize them on the spot with a publicly funded vaccine. We'd have to tell them to come back once we get that vaccine and we're able to do so. Yeah. Um, okay. If I could just do a small hop pursuit on that. And even in Ontario with the human papilloma virus vaccine for the publicly funded vaccine, uh, primary care providers can't just uh, administered either. It has to be um, processed through the local public health unit so there's that lost opportunity, right? You have the individual in your office and you can't immunize them. And we know that the, every opportunity matters. So pharmacists, it'd be great too if we could have it in primary care offices. Yeah, I, you know, I was in clinic on Friday and we saw um, a patient who was, you know, now that we're thinking about it, you know, she would have been eligible for HPV, but um, we, we have to order the dose from public Toronto Public Health, and then you know, hopefully the next time she comes in, we can give it to her. So yeah, I, I think it, there's that extra hurdle that makes it hard. I mean, fortunately, this patient's probably going to come back, so we can probably get her immunized. Okay, uh, next question: um, the current immunization record model often puts the onus on parents and individual patients to record their vaccines and then communicate them to a relevant health authorities. How can this be brought into 2020 and modernized to allow for better integration of healthcare? This is an age old question, I think. Karen or Sean, do you guys wanna weigh in on that? Well, I'll start with, you know, we have to get our technology to start talking to each other and then get comfortable with sharing our um, Healthcare records, you know, immunization is important for all of us. Uh, many of us uh, don't have yellow cards anymore. We've lost them. If you're, you know, if you do use the uh, Can Immunize app, that's great. But wouldn't it be great if that app could feed right into the record of the provider, whether it's the pharmacy reporting to your local public health unit? So, um, would behoove us to stop. Uh, hiding behind privacy on trying to get a registry going. Certainly in Ontario, we'd love it, but ideally it would be national registry. Mm -hmm. Or at least a series of provincial registries, at, at, at least. 
Yeah, we've been talking about well, that. Well, we have a series decades. of schedules, so I guess we could have a series of registered. Yeah. Sean, did you have anything to say on that? Well, I mean, I was just going to say that um, I, I absolutely agree. And and so, number one, it's a problem. I mean, every single patient I see, I ask about their immunization history. And I would say, if we're lucky, we get the yellow card. Almost nobody, you know, pulls out their, their phone and shows can immunize. Um, and people, it, it seems like they're almost you know, guessing what they have and when they got it. So it, it's definitely a problem. Number two, I agree, it would be brilliant if um, some sort of app on the phone was linked to health records and it just sort of populated health records um, as new data is entered. Um, but I also think, I mean, and I don't know if any of the other panelists know the answer to this, but the, the uptake of can immunize is not good. And I think that, you know, that the even if it was perfectly linked with the rest of the system, the fact that it's not widely used is, a, is almost a fatal flaw. And so I think that there need to be strategies to get people to, to use the, the tools that are available. Um, and I'm not sure what, what those are. Um, you know, I mean, when you look at how few people are using the, the COVID tracking apps, for example, which also seems to be like a kind of a no brainer, but they're, they're not being used. So I'm not sure what the strategies are to, to improve the, the uptake, but I think that's something we need to focus on as well. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's just the reality is that, you know, it's not as high a priority for a lot of people. I mean, I think the people, you know, on the panel and on the call, like immunizations are top of our minds, but I don't think we're representative of a large swath of the population, unfortunately. And, and it, to have, I mean, we, we've talked a lot sort of about opportunistic immunizing of people who present to different parts of the healthcare system. But that that hinges entirely on understanding when there's a gap, right? So it all of our solutions sort of start with, first of all, a good understanding of who is not fully immunized. And I think that that is a is a big, big problem. Um, I, I also think we have an opportunity now um, with all the discussion about the COVID vaccine and people really appreciating vaccines do make a difference. It's very easy in Canada to just, just yeah, you know, it's not a big deal. Sure, I get these, but you know, people don't see, rarely see measles here, you know, certainly things like polio. So there's probably uh, an opportunity to just a good reminder of the difference that vaccines make in our day-to-day -day lives. So just people asking more about them. Uh, again, the onus is still on the individual, but opens up the conversation. Yeah, and so this is just a, a, a kind of a follow-up question um, on this. So this is from Yunju Song. I'm not familiar with how pharmacists, physicians, and public health professionals at local public health units work together at the provincial level. Could you please share how our immunization information are being shared across the board? What are some platforms that the on the ground practitioners can come together to make nimble immunization delivery decisions or division of tasks when need be? Maybe, maybe I'll just weigh in quickly that, you know, basically I think what we're saying is that there is no system right now for all of these providers to share information, unfortunately. It's kind of left up to the patient to, to share with the health unit and to share with their family doctor and to share with the pharmacist or whoever. Um, and um, yeah, that's just unfortunately the reality right now. Our information systems are, are not yet uh, communicating uh, with one another. And I mean, hopefully COVID will spur greater action in this and you know lead to you know, there's been talk of a centralized uh, repository for COVID vaccines, and maybe that could be the basis that we can, you know, we can expand that to other uh, routine vaccinations. So that might be one uh, positive outcome from the COVID uh, pandemic that we may have the, the legacy of like having these uh, immunizations information systems put into place as a result of, of COVID. I, I don't know if anyone else wanted to weigh on that. I kind of like took over that question. Okay, I see head nodding. Okay, good. Um, okay, another question is, we have had such challenges in maintaining routine immunization in the wake of the pandemic alone. How can we ensure that we don't repeat or exacerbate this issue 
once COVID-19 vaccines become available? So I think this is a really good question. I guess this relates to both the routine immunizations as well as the COVID vaccines. I think it's like a two, two ways of interpreting this question. Well, one thing I would say, I think is to pick up on, on what Karen said before, is I think that this is a very unique time and opportunity we have in regards to the public thinking about vaccines in general. Um, and I think one of the answers to that question is I think that we as healthcare providers and, and the healthcare system need to really think carefully about how we can take advantage of that to educate people about vaccines, the diseases they prevent, um, the process of ensuring that vaccines are safe, the processes that exist to monitor for adverse events from immunization. We should basically take advantage of, of this unique time when there is more interest in, in vaccines than has ever been the case probably um, to help, I think, educate everybody about it. And I think that that is one part of, of you know, not exacerbating the problem, but taking advantage of the pandemic to, to ameliorate the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Anyone else want to comment on this? Ajit or Karen, do you have any comments on that? Okay. So here's a question I think probably for Ajit. How can training for pharmacists and primary healthcare providers and immunization techniques uh, will increase immunization rates for VPDs during the current pandemic? Yeah, I think uh, I, I showed that in in my presentation with the with the uh, sort of the tactical training that happens just looking at pharmacy school and if we, if we were to expand the training then we would have more confidence in the sort of the discussion and delivery of immunization services so I think the big thing is understanding those gaps understanding they exist understanding the risks that exist whether it's you know it's easy to do an age-based screen in a pharmacy database understanding a risk-based screen and it kind of lends itself to, to value in that visit as well. So those who are at risk for vaccine preventable disease also can have issues with medication management and adherence challenges. So I think just integrating that in will allow at the very least a conversation and that will have a sort of enact some sort of behavioral change, whether or not the patient can access the immunization uh, at the pharmacy or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess, you know, kind of uh, raising more awareness of this and education is good is a good thing for sure. And also, as you like you were talking about in pharmacy, it's a, you know, it's like a technical training. Well, I have actually in other um, healthcare professional training or education, there isn't a lot in vaccines either. I mean, you know, in nursing, how to give a needle, but, you know, as you said, it, that's a technical skill. Uh, you know, you learn about assessing for medication, but you don't really talk about vaccines that much. And then how to have that conversation about um, vaccine hesitancy. Like, really, it's no different than people having questions about other um, illnesses, situations they're facing, but people being comfortable with those questions and conversations. So I would say not just pharmacists uh, in school could improve that education. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. Um, here's a question for Sean, you know, based on your work in international settings, what can Canada learn from uh, vaccine delivery strategies in other contexts and countries? <clears throat> So it's a good question. Um, I mean, I guess for, for context in many lower income settings, the model where, where children will have a primary care provider that they routinely see is not a, a model that, that exists just due to general healthcare system weakness and, and few physicians. So I think, I think there's a few things that are, that are done in these settings that we could think about to possibly incorporate you know, best practices into our own system. So I think one is thinking about 
different settings for, for immunization. And, and we've touched on that a bit here already in terms of schools. We've talked about um, physician practices and we've talked about at the pharmacy, but I think we could contemplate thinking even more broadly about different locations for immunization. Um, I think we can think about uh, catch up campaigns. So that's not something that typically happens um, in higher income countries. However, uh, in, in lower income countries, certainly things, particularly with measles, periodic um, special immunization programs or catch-up campaigns are often conducted to sort of get all the kids that were missed for whatever reason in the past number of years. So that's not something that we typically do in our setting, but it's something that, that may make sense, particularly as we emerge from this pandemic. Um, I think we, we really need to... Um, think through best practices in, in information systems, which we've talked about several times. I mean, you know, every country in the world who is immunizing has one way or another, some better, some worse for um, record keeping and sharing that information and integrating that information to the broader healthcare system. So I think we, you know, we need to learn from others. Um, I think bundled care is maybe something to think about. So, so what will often happen um, in lower income countries is because contact with the healthcare system is often minimal, um, different interventions are, are bundled together. So, you know, examples may be um, during pregnancy. So there may be a tetanus vaccine. There may be um, information about nutrition. There may be, um, you know, the physical exam um, looking for, for complications of pregnancy it's combined with um, encouraging women to deliver in facilities versus at home. So multiple things bundled together. Um, and that, that same kind of approach, I think, could also be taken um, in, in higher income countries. So, I, so it's a good question. I think that there's an awful lot that could be learned um, from, from other countries, uh, including lower income countries around the world. Great, thanks. And here's a question for Karen. Um, you know, you said that, you know, public health, at least Toronto public health hasn't been giving, um, you know, the routine immunization, the school-based immunizations. Have, uh, and you mentioned that, you know, you've, you've, you did a poll of your colleagues within Ontario, but do you, are you aware of like, um, you know, beyond Ontario in Canada, like how other public health folks are addressing this issue? Um, I'm not aware uh of a lot, but they also have different delivery models in other provinces. So somewhere like Alberta, almost all the immunizations are given through local public health, which makes a difference to how people would access them. I don't know how actively they're running their clinics, um, but the beauty of the Alberta model is then at least the you know, from birth to finish, uh, the record is maintained in the the one information system. Um, yeah. But I do think this is a challenge across the country. Um, again, with that, you know, different models makes it hard to come up with a one size fits all approach. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's a question. Uh, drive through vaccination clinics haven't come up yet. Is this something that is working? So I don't know if anyone's heard of anything about drive through vaccination clinics for non-influenza vaccines. I, I just know that in the context of influenza vaccines, there have been some family physicians have been doing drive-through clinics. One of the local public health units has done drive-through clinics and they promoted them to their, uh, for their grade seven immunization program. Uh, they said, um, you know, it certainly wasn't without its challenges. It's definitely not the same impact as going into the school. But they did them, and so now they're going to pause them, uh, well, for weather-related reasons, but as well, given the schedule and the actual uh, interval you need between the first and second dose, they'll pause them and try to start up again. Um, but it was, again, only the one public health unit. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I think that's sort of consistent with what I said about being creative, about thinking about different um, locations to immunize people. Anecdotally, I mean, I have heard of at least one um, pretty big Toronto-based pediatric practice that was doing that um, in the, I guess, the late spring, um, sort of towards the end of the first wave. Um, and again, anecdotally, I heard that it was 
it seemed to be successful and, and the um, people who were part of that practice liked having that service. But I do not think it's anything that's been used um, in a systematic and widespread um, way, certainly in, in Toronto at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to find the space and depends on your patient population. A lot of people don't have cars and so you're not gonna do a drive-through clinic for them. Yeah. Okay, it looks like our time is up, unfortunately. Um, so there is one other question about, uh, you know, continuing interprofessional learning opportunities to update knowledge that I'm afraid we, we won't be able to get into. But I just wanted to thank all our panelists and our audience for listening. Um, and if you have any further questions, please do send them to the CVPD um, email address and we'll try our best to answer them. Um, so thank you all. I hope you all stay safe uh, with, you know, everything going on with wave two and I hope you all get vaccinated. Um, hopefully in the you know coming year with the COVID vaccine. Take care everybody. Bye now.